This is part eight in a series of videos in which I'm developing a plug-in replacement for the cassette drive on a Fluke 9010A microsystem troubleshooter. The idea is to replace the existing tape drive uh, with a drive that will support solid state memory. And I want it to be a direct drop-in. I don't want to have to modify the Fluke in any other way. I just want it to plug directly onto the same connector that the original cassette plugged onto. Now this is the second time I've shot this video. I actually shot the original yesterday. Um, but I received an interesting comment this morning on the previous video and it's kind of prompted me to reshoot this video uh, simply because I want to go into a bit more detail on the uh, engineering approach that I take for designing systems. And a lot of the time I see very unreliable systems that seem to be fundamental misunderstandings by the designer as to the inner workings of the devices they're using in their designs. So this will be a bit of a, a longer video than usual. If you're not interested in the explanation and you want to go straight to the uh, testing that I've got to uh, with this unit, then skip forward through the video. Um, but first I want to go through the uh, mythology I used and the thinking behind the design and why I took the approach that I did. So I'll get the fluke out of the way and um, we'll have a look at the, uh, the general design concept for this add-on unit and uh, as I say why I took this approach. Okay so I just want to go through a few of the points that were raised in the comment. Um, I think they show a fundamental misunderstanding on what we're trying to achieve here. And also, I think it would be an extremely interesting uh, exercise to go through this uh, because it does apply to many more things than just this particular design. I want to stress here, I'm not trying to pick on anyone. I'm not trying to say anyone's right or wrong. I'm not trying to say this is the right way of doing this or the wrong way. I just want to go through the thought process and that way uh, maybe it can be applied to other, th other things and you'll see why. Uh, I believe this is a, a fairly decent way to do this. So the comment um, really started by saying that, well, you could plug um, the data uh, bus directly into the parallel port on the PIC um, because it does have the capability for chip select. Uh, well, yes, it does. But firstly, if you watch the first video, you'll know that connecting the data bus directly to the PIC with nothing else connected prevents the fluke from booting and so that's uh, off the table for a start it, it wouldn't work. You could get around that by putting a buffer um, between the data bus and the PIC. That still won't work simply because we have uh, a, a wider requirement which I'll go into uh, shortly. So. In other words, trying to make direct use of the resources on something like a PIC or any other microcontroller for this type of application, at very best you're going to end up with race conditions and um, almost certainly you'll have an unreliable or flaky operation even if you can get it to work. So through this video I want to expand on that and show you uh, where the issues are and why that approach will cause a problem. But firstly, I thought what I'd do is explain why when you connect the data bus directly to the PIC, it stops the flute from starting up. It's nothing to do with the code that's running in the PIC. That's the important thing to bear in mind here because the code hasn't even started at that point. And all the pins on a PIC do default to inputs. So in theory, all you're doing is connecting the data bus to an input, the same as we're doing here in effect. Um, so why won't the flute start up? And it comes down to the design of the fluke itself, the way a pick works, and the way that the two of them interact when you connect them together. So although you can look at or imagine the input to the pick to be a single input, it actually isn't. And if you take a look at even a, a modest mid-range pick, and we look at the designation uh, for a particular port, this is port B on the device we're using here, you'll see that each individual pin can be one of many different functions. And that means that if you look through the data sheet and look at the representation of the circuit for each individual pin, you'll see there are six or seven different schematics all for a single pin on different parts of the data sheet. 
So in effect, each of the inputs on the pig is actually branching out internally within the pig to go to different circuits. And the problem there is because of the nature of the circuits are all different, some represent quite high loading. Uh, effectively, you're not connecting a single port. You're connecting maybe six or seven uh, potential input levels or loadings to the bus. Uh, and that's why you can't normally connect direct to a PIC. Uh, the second part of the comment was that um, he'd never known, he'd been designing with uh, PICs for a long time, but never known the issue I raised where if you try to write a value to a pin on a PIC, uh, it doesn't always respond. I found that surprising. I've been using PICs for 25 years and it's uh, an issue I've come across many times. And in fact, as we go through the code in this, you'll see there are measures I've taken to uh, deal with that. Uh, but it is a common problem on PICs. It does occur on other microcontrollers, and it is something that you do need to be aware of. So knowing the inner workings of the devices you are using um, is really, as far as I'm concerned, fundamental to good engineering design. If you don't know the building blocks that you're using, uh, you may get away with it for years, uh, or you may be developing flaky products for years. I'd much rather take the approach where I'm developing something I know is going to work reliably. And there are other aspects of doing it like this as well that we'll look at as we go through this video. So the first thing is to uh, look at what the requirement was and why we need to include separate buffers for this. And it really comes down to the way that the uh, fluke is working. So what we have, the interface to the fluke is a data, 8-bit data bus and four control lines. There are a few other lines as well but they're not directly included in the interface. So firstly when the fluke wants to send or retrieve data it thinks there's a, an 8041 device that it's talking to and because of that it expects to be able to read a status byte it expects the status byte to be updated whenever it writes data into the 8041. It doesn't really write direct to the status register, but it kind of has a side effect of changing some of the contents. Uh, and then it expects to be able to read from uh, a data register, and it expects to be able to write to a data register. But when it's doing this, it will assert the chip enable line will take the chip enable line low. At the same time, it will set the uh, values it wants depending on what which register it's trying to update and whether it's writing or reading, whether it's a status read or write or a data read or write. And then it will expect the data to either appear on the data bus in the next uh, 9010A clock cycle. Uh, or it will expect the data to be read in the next clock cycle or by the end of the next clock cycle. So in other words, the data that it's putting onto this bus is only here for maybe half a microsecond. Now, one of the comments was that, well, you could use an interrupt within the PIC uh, because that will be far more responsive than handling this in the main loop of code. Yes, it can be more responsive, but the problem you get is that, let's say we had a chip enable line connected direct to a pin of the PIC that was going to generate an interrupt. Then from the time when the um, chip enable line goes low, that triggers the interrupt mechanism within the PIC. The problem is it can take maybe three or four clock cycles to get into the uh, interrupt trigger mode and then the code that's uh, required to run in the PIC has to push certain key values, key registers onto the stack and then you end up in the um, interrupt routine. That can take maybe 20 to 30 clock cycles. Now although this device is running at 48 megahertz, if you're familiar with PICs then you'll know that the actual clock is divided by four in turn, it's a four phase uh, instruction cycle within the PIC. So the instruction cycle is only 12 megahertz uh, and that means that we're still looking at maybe four microseconds to get into the interrupt and then you've got to handle dealing with the data, getting the data out of the memory chip, uh, putting it onto the bus. Uh, that can take several hundred clock cycles even if you've got a very fast memory. And so 
because the fluke is asserting the chip enable line and then trying to read the data in the next uh, 9010A clock cycle, you've only got about 0.3 microseconds to uh, respond to its request, uh, not the 20 or 30 microseconds it would actually take you even using an interrupt. On top of that, if it's trying to write data to the memory, so it's, if it's in the right mode, and it's taking data from the fluke to put into memory, then you've got the interface between the PIC and the memory to deal with. So if you want to deal with this in real time and be able to write uh, data, uh, maybe you know, 0.1, 0.2 microseconds per write, you can't use serial data. Serial, most cheap serial data, which is what I want to use here for cost reasons, uh, may have as uh, long a uh, latency as 10 milliseconds. And that makes it 30,000 times too slow to use um, a mechanism where we're dealing directly with an interrupt. So the way that the flute reads data is there is a, a status byte. And if we look at the values in the status byte, this is what it expects to read when it asks for the status byte. We have a couple of flags here. So there's various things that tell um, the 9010A the status of the cassette. And some of these still apply, even though we're using uh, a memory card, we still have to uh, make sure the fluke is aware that it's present before it tries to write to it. Um, but the two we're interested in here really are the uh, two uh, top flags. One is output buffer full and one is input buffer full. And the way these work is the input buffer full flag is set whenever the fluke writes data into the incoming data latch and the output buffer full is set to 1 whenever the PIC writes data into the output data latch. So in other words, the 9010A, before it tries to do any tr data transfers, it um, downloads or it reads the status byte, checks the status of those flags to see if it is currently allowed to write data or if it's currently got data in the latch that it can read. And then it's the um, responsibility of the PIC to keep those uh, values maintained. So that means that as long as we stick to this type of uh, semaphore messaging, we get a, a major advantage here in that the, the fluke will be coming around every microsecond or so when we're trying to read data, for example. And if we didn't have some means to uh, throttle the 9010A, it would keep missing data and it'd read the wrong data. So the 9010 reads the status byte every half microsecond or so, and it doesn't try to actually read any data until the bit in the status byte indicates there is some valid data there to read. And that means that we can take as long as we like in the pig to put the data into the latch, and as long as we put the data in before we set the status bit, then we know we're not going to have any uh, issues with data being lost. And the same with incoming data, as long as um, we're able to properly maintain the status byte in a sensible, timely fashion, then it will be fine. And because the time taken between a data write and a data read from the fluke is actually about 200 microseconds, that gives us plenty of time to deal with that. Even so, I still deal with that in uh, an interrupt. In fact, we have two separate interrupt routines at different interrupt vectors, um, and that's specifically for speed. I, I want to make sure we don't have a race condition here, so the actual um, time it's taking to deal with the interrupt is actually only about a tenth of the time that we have between um, possible reads, so we are well within the scope here of uh, uh, a factor of safety. So, as I say, the way this works is that um, when it's reading data from the uh, 9010, it waits for the um, flag which is set by the uh, uh, control lines uh, to be in the state indicating data is in the incoming data latch. It then reads the data. It sets the, or rather clears that particular um, bit in the status byte only after it's written it to memory. And that can take, there's no timeout on the fluke, so that could take a microsecond, it could take 10 minutes. The fluke will just keep waiting until that's done and until the flag gets reset.
I'll show you where that particular part of the code is in a few minutes. Um, but this is important. It means that we can have an interface between the PIC and the memory that's as fast or as slow as we want to make it. The only thing that's going to be um, evident is how long it takes to do a tape read or a tape write. Having said that, it's still going to be probably over a thousand times faster than the cassette. So the overall way that a cassette is uh, dealt with is when we press the write key on the fluke, then the, it's quite a complex process that is gone through using this kind of um, back and forth data flow, which is why we can't use a single port. There's various steps that are involved. So firstly, the um, command from the fluke to write is issued and then it expects the controller to deal with the rest on its own so normally that would be to rewind the cassette wait until it sees the end of um, tape leader reverse the direction of the tape wind it forward until such point as it's ready to start writing the data and then it tells the fluke that it's uh, at that point the fluke then starts transferring data using this semaphore system and it transfers one byte at a time until the uh, contents of the fluke memory are sent. And what it does at the end of that is it rewinds the tape, it then reads the tape, and it compares the contents of the tape it's just written with the contents of the memory in the fluke. And if they don't match, it knows that there's been an error in the write, and it flags up an error. It then rewinds the tape, um, and only when it's done all that will, will you see the OK message on the screen of the fluke. If anything goes wrong in any of this process, uh, then you'll get a, an error showing on the fluke display. If you want to do a read, you press the read key on the fluke, and a similar sort of system, it rewinds the tape, winds it off the uh, end of tape leader, and then it informs the uh, fluke it's ready to start uh, sending data. And then again, it uses this semaphore system to send data to the fluke. But because we're using the semaphore system, again, there's no restriction on memory speed here. The thing to bear in mind is if we draw a line down the center of this diagram, everything on the left is a hardware system. So the transfer of data in and out is a hardware responsive system. So it only takes uh, a few, maybe a few tens of nanoseconds uh, for this part of the system to respond and put the data onto the data bus. It also doesn't load up the data bus accessibly, so it doesn't uh, prevent the fluke from booting up. And of course it also means that we have full control over exactly the way our peripheral uh, device works. This also means it doesn't matter what device we use for the microcontroller. This interface is quite simple. All we need is to make sure we have one that's reasonably quick and has um, in, at least, um, in theory, a decent uh, interrupt system. Uh, and then on the right, again, uh, it doesn't matter what memory system we use, it doesn't matter how slow or fast it is, um, as long as uh, it can store enough data, then it will work fine. So the way I've decided to design this, as I say, we have four latches. Um, command or status out, status in, data out, data in. We've got a decoder so that the correct um, latch can be selected by the fluke. And then we've got another latch that latches the state of the control lines. And this is what's used to trigger the interrupts within the PIG. I've then got a separate interface going to the memory devices. And then another uh, few lines are used to monitor some uh, switch positions. These are dip switches and these will allow each of the memory cards to act as if though it's multiple tapes. So if we use four lines and each card will effectively replace 16 tapes. On top of that what I'm going to be doing is having a separate set of um, switches and a memory chip on the actual board. So there'll be this main board, it will have a memory chip and some switches so the board will be able to use um, its own memory and won't require the memory card. I was going to limit it to that, but I realized that if I did that, you wouldn't be able to transfer the programs from one fluke to another. Uh, so there'll be a second um, channel, if you like, 
that will enable you to plug in an additional memory card and select various banks within that card. So you can either use the memory on the main board and use that and nothing else, or if you've got more than one fluke, you can plug in an extra memory card, save data into that, and then transfer that if you want into another fluke. And incidentally, this is another reason for using this approach is that the different flukes will potentially have different firmware, and we don't want to have a race condition where you have a, a system developed on one uh, version of the fluke and then it will just start falling on its face when uh, it goes to another fluke. We see this all the time with tablets where um, an application will work fine in one tablet and as soon as you install it on something else it just uh, doesn't work. Uh, and it drives me insane, it's bad design and that's why I take this approach. So what we'll do now is we'll have a very quick look through the um, firmware. Um, bear in mind what we're trying to achieve here. So if we look at the original code, we've seen this before, and it's really a main loop that waits for an incoming uh, command. It's a bit odd in the way the commands are handled, but uh, I won't go into that right now, but it's, um, it's dealt with in a separate loop. So once it gets into the function, what the function's really doing is it's going round and it's checking the status of the flag bits it's seen if there is new data in the incoming data buffer. If there is, it reads it, sends that data through to the cassette. Once that's done, it clears the flag, and then the fluke is free to write the next byte to the buffer. That's very slow. Obviously, writing the data to the tape is very slow compared to the speed of the fluke. So this loop goes around many, many times um, for each byte that's written to the cassette and that is fairly important because the, there's a huge mismatch of course between the speed of the cassette and the speed of the fluke and so there are various timers in here to make sure that all this works it's constantly checking to make sure the cassette is still there that there are no errors once it's got to the end of the write cycle it informs the um, fluke that it's completed and then it rewinds the tape the fluke waits until the tape has been rewound. It then issues a read command. It then goes into the uh, read function. And then the read function is responsible for reading the data back out of the tape. And the fluke checks to make sure that what it's written matches what's in uh, internal memory. If it's not, it issues an error. And it then waits until the end of file command um, has been reached. Assuming there are no errors, it then tells the tape to rewind, and then assuming the tape rewinds successfully, you get the OK message on the fluke screen to terminate the process. A read is uh, more straightforward, it just um, really runs the second part of that, but it doesn't do the validation. If you're just reading the tape, then you're not uh, interested in comparing the contents of the tape with current memory, because obviously you're trying to overwrite the current memory. Um, also bear in mind that what you're writing to the tape is also the system configuration for the fluke, it's not just the data and the programs. Uh, so that's what we have to replicate in our code. Uh, so there's quite a bit going on and it's, um, it is important that the mechanism we put in place will handle that reliably and also will deal with um, errors and aborts. So if something happens and um, you abort the read or the write for example, then our system has to be able to handle that and uh, be able to restart. So if we look at the firmware, like I said, I won't go through this in too much detail. I'll just very quickly run through it. Um, again, you don't need to use a pick. You could use something else as long as the general functionality is maintained. And this really is why this left-hand part of the system is designed like this. This is the correct way, as far as I'm concerned, to uh, interface to an older system. Uh, and again, bear in mind the signals on the fluke are not uh, necessarily uh, quite as good as the pig would like. So you do need to take that into account. Um, so what we're looking at here is uh, initially setting up the configuration for the pig. Uh, that's to make sure it's running and has all the uh, peripheral devices set up the way that you want. I then define some values for uh, setting these individual bits so rather than having to remember what each bit is I actually give them names uh, and that way I can refer to these in code and it's much clearer also if one's wrong I need to change it 
I'll just change it here and then that change will propagate through the rest of the code. Now we then set or we then create uh, certain variables. There's not a huge number of independent variables here. Some are marked as volatile because they're used in the um, interrupts. And then I generate a, a flags um, construct. Uh, I won't show all the files, some are just there to generate um, uh, constructs that I use in the code. Uh, I then use a multi-byte um, buffer and the reason this is here is temporary. This is just to do the testing. I don't currently have the memory device attached um, so I'm saving um, the data into the internal memory in the PIC. It's limited in size, it's only a 1k buffer so I'm limited to the amount of data I can store but uh, the PIC's only going to write uh, seven or 800 bytes unless I start putting in some fairly long programs. Um, we then have to uh, generate a pointer to that table because it's a multi-bank um, buffer. You can't just write directly to it, you need to use a, a far pointer. So don't worry about that, that's, that's not really going to be a final part of the code, that's just there for testing, but I just thought I'd say why it's um, written like this. We then have to generate the interrupts themselves. Uh, these are the interrupt routines, there are two. And the reason I've um, decided to use two interrupts rather than one is because when we enter the interrupt, it means we don't have to have extra code trying to figure out which particular um, input triggered this interrupt. Uh, we know which interrupt it was, and so we can go straight into the meat of the um, interrupt handler without the extra latency that would be created using a, a handler at the beginning of the interrupt. And all these interrupts do is they update the status of the uh, output buffer full flag and the input buffer full flag. And that's just to make sure the system has the responsiveness that we need to work in this environment. Uh, we then go through and we um, initialize, there's a bit of uh, assembly code I should say here and that's just to define the vectors for the interrupts. We then go through and initialize the various values at the start of the main function. We set the values, the initial values in some of the latches. We need to do that because um, the flute will start reading these straight away so we don't want to have a situation where the fluke is thinking we're trying to do something here when uh, at boot up we should be doing nothing at all. Uh, and then we clear the buffer, again this won't be here in the final version, this is just, um, we don't even need it here really, it's just to make it easier to debug so uh, I could see the bytes that were changing uh, after each boot up. We then start an infinite loop and all the infinite loop does, this bit's commented out, I'm still doing some um, debugging in this, um, the first part of the loop is responsible for uh, checking and waiting for command codes. When there's a command code it puts the firmware into a particular state and the reason for this is we need to handle the expectations of the fluke and so uh, there are various things that need to be initialized as each command is received. Of course we still need to be able to receive the commands themselves which are not in the data uh, latch. They're actually in the status right even though um, the value written to the status register is not written directly to it in the original uh, system. But we have to do this here because obviously we don't have the hardware uh, connection between the incoming data bus and the status register. So once we've received the command, this is very similar now to the uh, structure of the original system, we're in the write mode, which is similar to the write mode loop we saw in the original firmware. And all it's really doing here is it's taking data, um, dealing with the data, setting the status register accordingly, and um, then resetting the flag to let the uh, fluke know that it's actually read the data. The fluke will respond by putting more data into the buffer. I mentioned earlier about the possibility of lines on picks not being set correctly. That's why this particular instruction is repeated. Um, it's just to make sure that that line is set correctly. If I had a single line here, and I did try this, um, it doesn't work correctly. It's very flaky and sometimes it will work and sometimes it won't. It depends on uh, exactly uh, 
uh, how the, the ribbon cable was set on the uh, controller. It might be fine once the controller is on a PCB, but I really don't like having to rely on the physical positioning of boards for them to work. I want them to work reliably. And doing it like this, uh, it works 100% reliably and there is no possibility of a missetting of uh, this value. One thing to bear in mind if you do this, um, this is not a good way to do it by the way, and the reason for this is if you turn optimization on for this compiler, it will take three of these lines out and you end up with a bug that you were trying to get rid of in the first place. Um, because the compiler for the pick, or at least the one I'm using, when you turn optimization on it will remove any dead code and that would include something that's not achieving anything. And from its perspective, the third, the second, third and fourth lines here are just duplicating the first one so it will say well there's no point in being there, it will take them out. It won't tell you it's done that, you'll just find that the bug has um, you know, been unreliable and you won't know why. Uh, so you might want to put a, a knob in here or something else. Um, I didn't want to put a, a call to a delay in there but uh, something else might be more reliable to make sure that um, it's not taken out by the compiler. I've got optimization off for this, I don't really need it turned on, it's a very small piece of code, plenty of space in the pick and speed wise. Um, I want to make sure that it's going through the loops exactly as I designed them, I don't want it being optimised and jumping around in other ways. Um, so it goes through, writes the data to memory, and one thing to bear in mind here is you'll see in this part of the loop I've got these lines commented out but there are delays. This was I was simulating the speed of the tape drive and seeing this is just to make absolutely certain that we didn't have a race condition and that the semaphore system was working and it wasn't just a case of this system being much faster than the fluke and that being the reason it worked. Um, so I'll demonstrate this in a few minutes but if I uncomment these lines uh, this is the point where we are trying to write the information to the memory device. This is where we have the data in the pick and we're trying to get it into the memory device and being able to have delays up to, well, as long as we want, we could have an hour delay if we wanted to. Um, it means that we can use very cheap serial EE proms and although it might take 10 milliseconds to write uh, a page to the EE prom, in terms of the speed compared to the PIG, it uh, still is very fast. I'll demonstrate that in a few minutes, um, but the point here is that we need to be able to have delays here that aren't going to make this thing fall over otherwise again it will be unreliable or flaky and we need to make sure this is 100% reliable that's really what I aim for with all the designs that I do. Uh, same thing down here as earlier we're repeating the instruction here just to make absolutely certain that these lines are set correctly again if I only did this once and again I tried this it doesn't work correctly uh, this is important, it's something that no end of people have problems with picks and they, they're scratching their head for a very long time and just make it absolutely certain that if you are connecting to a bus that is fairly heavily loaded that um, you are setting the, the values correctly. The best way to look at this is to um, do the write and then immediately do a, a read and bear in mind the data port out is the latch of the port, not the port itself. So what I suggest you do is write to the latch and then immediately read the port and then put a breakpoint just after and then run to the breakpoint and make sure that the two values are the same. If they're not the same then you're having a problem with um, uh, bus loading. And I always do that with all the uh, systems I develop. Most of what I developed was um, critical systems for medicine and hospitals, this sort of thing. So I had to be very careful but even so good coding is good coding. So uh, whether it's for something like this that's not critical or for a critical system, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it makes no difference. Okay. okay, so very quick run through that. I hope it made some sense. What I'll do now is get the fluke back onto the bench and we'll give it a quick test to see how well it works so far. Okay, so looking at the um, device so far, then what we have are the um, four latches, it's one here, one here, one here and one here and that's these four latches. We have the decoder which is up here, we then have the 4-bit latch which is this, 
we've got the pig over here and again you could use any type of microcontroller you can see the interface um, is quite minimal there's not that many control lines we will of course have the interface going out to the memory um, but currently it's using the internal pick memory but uh, what I want to demonstrate here is that firstly that it works but also that um, we can have a very long latency in writing to the memory so we can use whatever memory we want okay so relatively straightforward what I've been doing here is anytime I've got more complexity in the firmware I've taken a step back modified the hardware to minimize the need for complexity in the firmware and that's why the firmware itself is only about three or four hundred bytes so what we'll do now is give this a quick run now firstly of course it should boot up we don't want uh, this thing to stop the uh, fluke from booting and the fluke shouldn't even be aware that it's not talking to a cassette drive uh, as ever apologies for flicker on the screen I can't really prevent that so what I'll do to start with is just enter uh, a, a couple of quick uh, programs doesn't really matter what's in them but if you're familiar with the way the flute works then when you press program it asks for a program number so we'll call it program one if the program exists then it will open the program set you on the first line of the program and tell you how big the program is in bytes if the program does not exist then it will say program created so we can see that one's been created I'll just put a couple of instructions in there press program again and it then tells us how many bytes are left free although I said the, the cassette holds 12k um, it only holds a little over 10k of program data the rest of it is uh, configuration data so when you write and read from the tape it also uh, reads and writes the configuration of the machine so it's quite nice in that um, way because it means if you configure the fluke to do certain types of testing then when you load the tape uh, it will re-establish that configuration and I have tapes for different types of testing so for example I've got a tape to test the Wren I've got a tape to test pets that sort of thing um, the tapes are very expensive and hard to find so it became kind of a bit inconvenient doing that which is why I decided to do this it means I can have a separate configuration and set of tests uh, for every type of machine that I work on okay I'll do one more program so program 2 and again I'll just enter a couple of instructions press program again and what we should have now are two programs so program 1 you can see is 14 bytes long and program 2 is 19 bytes long and if I now come to uh, saving the data all I have to do is hit right tape I get a message and straight away we know it's working to a certain degree because if we didn't have this unit present we get an error also this link here will be um, used to determine if there is a, uh, a memory card present but also there will be a second link that will determine whether or not the memory card is right protected so there will be a right protect switch on the memory cards so in this case we'll say yes we do want to uh, write the data if this was a real cassette then it would rewind the cassette wind the cassette forward to the start of where the data was going to be written tell the fluke it was ready the fluke would then send all the data from memory that could take five to ten minutes it will then rewind the tape it will then start to read it will read the tape again that will take five to ten minutes and if any of the bytes don't match what's in memory you'll get an error on the screen so it can easily take ten minutes or more to um, write a tape if you've got a lot of data in the fluke and it's uh, obviously a bit inconvenient doing that you'll see this is slightly different so I'll hit yes and it's finished uh, so that whole process was successful and took about two or three seconds now admittedly there's only um, a, a couple of very short programs in here uh, so what I can do now is make sure the programs are still there of course and we haven't destroyed them and of course there they are um, what I'll do now is create a third program and because it doesn't exist it's going to come up with created we'll enter some data for it exit if I now try and open that program program 3 
you can see it's eight bytes long. But if we now read the cassette back, then it will overwrite all the memory and it should actually get rid of program three because it will just put back what was there before we did the second write. So read the tape, yes, and again, very quick, it's finished. And we should still have programs one and two, so 14 bytes for program and just to check that what's there is correct, that's what we put in. Program two, again, 19 bytes, but program three should not exist because uh, we created that after we wrote the tape. So program three should say created now. And as you can see, we've just created program three again. So we'll actually create some instructions for program three. Okay, so program three now exists. And so we'll now write the tape again to save program three as well again it's finished and if we now look at uh, well, for example try program 4 it shouldn't exist so it was created because it didn't exist and we'll now read the tape so that's finished so programs 1 2 and 3 should now exist 14 bytes 19 bytes and then we should have program 3 we do the program 4 should not exist because that was created after we wrote the tape and as you can see it's created and so it's I, I've tested this hundreds of times now and it is very reliable it's um, works exactly as it's supposed to you can see it's extremely fast it just takes a few seconds to read the entire contents to memory now it could be slower if we are writing to slow EEPROM so what I'll do now is I'll just reprogram the PIC and what I'll do is in the source code I indicated there was a section um, that I could put a delay into to simulate the tape speed. What I'll do is I'll put a 10 millisecond delay at that point so that will simulate a fairly slow serial EEPROM. Um, very cheap EEPROMs but they're quite slow and then we'll rerun this test again and we'll see if um, the speed uh, impact is, is very significant or if it's still acceptable. Okay I've modified the code in the PIC and um, what I've done is in the write mode loop when it's writing data to the memory I've inserted a 10 millisecond delay at this point so this is where it writes the data to the memory and this will simulate the speed of a serial EEPROM so this will give us an idea as to how uh, quickly this will work if we use an EEPROM and also we're testing here to make sure that our semaphore system works and that the system still works if we have a 10 millisecond delay here. Now of course a 10 millisecond delay in a microprocessor loop is, is a very significant delay. It's, it slows the loop down by a factor of about 30,000 so we need to make sure that the system is still going to be reliable if we do that. Uh, and also of course it means it uh, fully proves that we can use uh, whatever speed memory we want and we don't need to go for expensive uh, fast memory to try and keep up. Okay so we'll boot up the fluke and it starts up fine. Again I'll enter a, a quick program and we'll do program 2 as well. Okay, uh, and then we'll try writing the tape. So this time it's going to simulate the speed we would have with an actual serial EEPROM. So from the time when we say yes, uh, we want to time it and see how long it's going to take before it completes the operation. As I said with the cassette, this would take about 10 minutes, um, but hopefully this will be significantly faster. Okay, so it's finished. I didn't cut anything out of the um, video there. That's exactly how long it took. So about two or three seconds, so it's, it's very quick, it does not take very long at all. It would take longer if we had more data of course, but um, working it out it shouldn't ever take more than about 14 seconds if the um, memory of the flute was totally full. Uh, so what we can do now hopefully is reread the tape, it won't make much difference to the speed because reading the memory, uh, even a serial EEPROM is still fairly fast compared to writing it.
uh, but what we'll do is we'll create program three. Just, this is just to confirm that it's properly reading the uh, the contents of the uh, memory, and we'll give a quick instruction. Okay, so program three exists. If we go back into it, you can see it's opened. Program one and program two. Okay, and what we'll do now is read the tape. Program three should disappear. So again, very fast. And again, I didn't cut anything out of the video there. That's how long it takes. Um, we should now find that program one and two are still there. Program one, program two. But program three should be created because it shouldn't be uh, in memory now. And as you can see, it's working fine. So in other words, it's working fine. Uh, I'll reread the tape a few times just so you can see that it uh, reads reliably uh, every time. So that's fine. And this is exactly how long it's taking. I'm not modifying or editing the video at this point. And we'll rewrite the tape, which is obviously the slightly slower bit. And as you can see, it's working fine. So. It's looking extremely promising. Um, we can expect the performance um, from the electronic side to be even better once it's on a proper PCB. Um, but like I said, the idea is to have memory on the actual card, uh, the base card, uh, and then to have small memory module cards that can be plugged in as well uh, to allow data to be transferred from one fluke to another. Uh, any comments welcome. If you think you're going to be interested in one of these, let me know so I know how many boards to initially order. Um, hopefully it's, uh, it wasn't too long and winded video but I thought it was worth covering some of the design aspects it, uh, it is quite interesting as ever it's meant to be enjoyable so uh, the main thing here is designing equipment uh, it is fun uh, it can be frustrating sometimes and certainly something like this is fairly challenging because of the uh, requirements to uh, have one type of um, system talk to a completely different sort of system and it is uh, quite an interesting design challenge. Uh, if you want more information on the design or if you want me to go into more detail on any aspect of it then uh, please leave a comment.